20 years, 22, 25 years. He had a seer with his brother serving in a, in a high-end capacity in the army. Think about Joseph. Joseph had a dream, and that went a long time. He even went to prison. Was a slave. Was in prison. But God is always faithful to his promise. So if his word said, if his Holy Spirit has promised it to you, it's happening. There's no devil in hell or circumstance on earth that can keep you away from the promises that God has for you. We all stand with us as we sing. Please join us.
He paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I couldn't pay. I needed someone to wash my sin away. And now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace, the whole day long. Christ Jesus paid a debt that I could never pay. He raised this life up from the dead. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. So our lives are resurrected from death, from bondage, from all of these chains that bind us up. And then we have life. Not only do we have eternal life, but we have life and life more abundantly. There should be an abundance that spills out, that our, that our cup has overflowed with the abundance that God has poured in. And the more we get in relationship with God, the more God's favor is, is open to us. God's favor is free, and we don't work for God's favor. That's why it's God's favor and His grace. But we cannot have the full monty of opportunity without following you. And so, God, we just ask that, that you would just touch our hearts. You give us the strength to really follow you more and seek you more and be in love with you more. And for goodness sake, get excited about Jesus every once in a while because we get excited about something else. If we don't stand for something, we'll fall for anything. So God, I just pray. I just pray a, a blessing over our folks that are here this morning and over those that are not. God, I pray that you'll be with them. Mr. Doug is dealing with some different things. He can't be here. There's so many others that we could list. God, I pray that you would touch them. God, right now, I pray that your spirit would just settle on each and every person that wanted to be a part today and couldn't. God, I pray that you would touch their heart, that you would minister to them. There's people that are here that are less excited about being here than those that want to be here and cannot. So God, I pray that you would touch our hearts in a special way. In Jesus' name. Uh, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Yes. So. Uh, yes. So. So. Say it loud. I didn't. So. Uh, Psalms 107 says this for us. And you just listen as you're at Isaiah 43. You don't have to turn anywhere else. Psalmist writes, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. For His loving kindness is everlasting. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom He has redeemed from the hand of the adversary. He's gathered from the lands, from the east. You're going to hear that again in a moment. From the east, from the west, from the north, from the south, from the sea. They wandered in the wilderness in a desert region. They didn't find a way. Uh, they did not find a way to an inhabited city. They were hungry. They were thirsty. Their soul fainted within them. They, then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He delivered them out of the distresses. He led them also by a straight way to go into an inhabited city. He led them to give thanks to the Lord for his love and kindness. Think about that. He led them to the Lord. He led them to give those thanks. And I want you to think about that this morning. Uh, this week, I found myself, like many of you, in just major decisions that needed to be made. Many of us that sit in this building this morning either are, currently are, have been, will be, ever how you fit in that equation, making some major decisions, some that are affected in life in a major way. Brad, Frida, and Brad's mom was here this morning, Miss Louise, and things that went on with her in Texas, and she's here now and made the decision there. Keen White, he's uh, going to be having some major surgeries and other things, dealing with family issues that, that have happened in their life, and just Twice to them, dealing with cancer and the family and different things that are going on in their families. Court proceedings, I sat in a court this week and just listened to some things with that. And I thought about what are we under? Job situations, family, financial needs, housing needs, 
Uh, some are on the mountaintop like kids in a new house this week. Some are struggling to make ends meet. So we got different end of, ends of the spectrum. Where, where do we all fit in when we think about that? Let's look at what it says in Isaiah. I want to share some thoughts with you this morning. Where you find if you do a little research, you'll see that there's been some accusations that God has made upon his people. There's some things that have happened, and you go and look at the sections of Isaiah. I don't have time to take you there this morning to look at all of that, but those accusations and the sections and all of that, and, and just really looking at judgment on Israel. And then we come to Isaiah 43, and we find the redemption process. We find the fact of uh, the encouraging process. We said in a leadership team meeting, uh, a small group last week, and we were talking about encouragement. Talking about the need of. And you find the fact that the children of Israel were in the midst of the need of encouragement. Great encouragement. And so we find what we're about to share this morning uh, in a way that's encouraging to us as it was to the children of Israel. And it gave hope. And it gave direction. And it gave wisdom. And I'm telling you, when we think about that, I, I, we think about the joys of God and the, the, the pleasantness the, of God and the presence uh, of God. Let's look at it and just see what it says, and then we'll, we're going to make a few comments this morning. But now, Prophet Isaiah writes, Thus says the Lord. The Lord says, the word Lord there, Yahweh. Yahweh says, your creator. The word there is actually your shaper. The one who... Forms you. I should have had Casey. I showed you the pictures of the twins several weeks ago, and and and, they, and Brittany went on Friday, and just uh, we were in awe of the the detail of that sonogram picture, the shaping of God of these two little angels that we're almost witnessing week to week to week, but the details. And then I sat back and I thought about how those people that say those babies are not living individuals. God, the Word says that He's creator, that, that He formed us, He shaped us. O oh, Israel. And He says, do not fear, for I redeemed you. Keep in mind the redemption. He's telling them actually, look, I'm redeeming you before it actually ever happens. Same thing He did for us. He provided a way of redemption before we ever accepted. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you go through the rivers, they will not overflow. They will overflow you. They will not overtake you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor your, will the flame burn you or come up around you. It's the, the thought process there. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I have given Egypt as a ransom. Kush. And, and see, but the word there really are the places north of uh, North Africa. Cush is Ethiopia, so Egypt, Ethiopia, Africa. Since you are precious in my sight, otherwise God is willing to give to do whatever He needs to do for His people. Since you are precious in my sight, since you are honored, I love you. I will give other men in your place and other peoples in exchange. For your life. Looking back at the Exodus, looking at uh, the Exodus narrative coming out of Egypt, you think about that from that standpoint. Do not fear. Verse 5, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up south, and not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name and whom I have created for my glory. Thinking there in terms of the Jews returning unto Jerusalem. Analogy for you and I going home to the heavenly home. And whom I have created for my glory, whom I have formed, even whom I have made. Verse 8, bring out the people who are blind, even though they have uh, eyes, and the deaf, even though they have ears. They're not seeing, they're not hearing, they're not listening. Well, it's much like the world in which we live today. We're not hearing the word. People are not hearing and abiding by the signals of what do we see. All the nations have gathered together in order that the peoples may be assembled. Who among them can declare this and proclaim to us the former things? 
Let them present their witnesses that they may be justified. Dealing with false gods there. Proof of present, past, future. Uh, or let them hear and say it is true. Then look what he says. This is to you and I. To the believers. To the Jewish people at that day. You are my witnesses. Declares the Lord. And my servant whom I have chosen. In order that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he before me, there was no God born. And there will be none after me. You stop right there. Somebody this week we were in discussion and they were dealing with the facts. Somebody wanted them to tell them where God came from. It's a faith issue. The Word of God tells us that there is no God born before me. There will be no God after me. And the only thing you can tell when somebody's dealing with that aspect, it comes back to a faith issue. And believing in what we see and what we understand. And dealing and walking with that in that sense. He says, I, even I, am the Lord. And there is no Savior. Look, look at the play there. The little S versus verse 3. The big S. There is no other Savior besides me. It is I who have declared and saved and proclaimed. That's a great underline right there. And there is no strange God among you. So you are my witnesses, declares the Lord. And I am God. Even from eternity, I am He. And there is none who can deliver out of my hand. Look what he says, last part of verse 13, verse 13 very important. I am, and who can reverse it? Otherwise, God is there. Nothing can change your mind. He is God. Father, in the name of Jesus, let the redeemed of the Lord say, God, help us to draw close this morning. Help us to hear from you. Help us to, God, seek you like we've never sought you before. And then to just live it. God, I pray this morning. God, for the time of the Master's hand. On all of us in this building, God, all of us, Lord, who desire that touch, that, Lord, that there would be that encouragement, that touch, that, that movement of God. And, Lord, that we would see you in a way like we've never seen you, that, God, we would believe in you like we've never believed before, that we would trust like we've never trusted. God, that we place our faith maybe in you and to a level to which we have never done before. God, if, Lord, let the redeemed of the Lord. Say so in Christ. Amen. When we think about it, how important it is, you know, when you think uh, of our life and, uh, you know, just listening and going back to what I was saying a moment ago, teaching, moving in our new home, a uh, couple was proclaiming uh, this week, somebody said, man, we're having a time in our life. We're, we're in the midst of where God really wants to move in our life. And when the family of God is all together, the, the movement of God, the nurturing of God, the, 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 just the telltale signs. Uh, thinking about even in our past life, uh, thinking about in past days, not past life, past days, from the standpoint of all of us probably can say, hey, I failed at some point. Something's happened in my life. Then look where we are today. Look at the hand of God. Look at the touch of God today. And, and when you think about Isaiah 43, is that Israel finds itself in deep need of a hand of a touch of God, the, the encouragement of God. And uh, when you think about that, I mean, this, this week, just in passing, uh, both times, well, several other times too, but two times at the hospital, had two guys just come up and just begin to speak to me in a way. One uh, was Raymond in the cafeteria, and then another, I don't know his name, but I know who he is, I see him all the time at the hospital, just begin to speak about what God was doing in their life. And uh, Raymond in the cafeteria said, man, go home and read Isaiah 50. And, and just look at what God's doing in the midst of that. And we just had a conversation while he was cooking there in the cafeteria. And, and then uh, this other guy was talking about, he said, Pastor, he said, uh, man, I, I'm, I'm complete next amount of years from the hospital. And he said, man, I, I'm leaving. I said, what do you mean you're leaving? He said, man, I, I know God. Uh, there's some things that I just need to do. And he said, I've sold out to God. God's given me a business to serve the Lord in construction and help people who are not able to help themselves. And he said, I just know God is telling me to step out. He said, people are questioning. He said, I know God is in it. 
And he said, I'm moving on. And uh, just to be able to speak the truth that he was speaking and the freedom that was in both of those young men's lives and, and just following the footsteps of Jesus, the encouragement. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Tell the world what God is doing, has done in your life. And, uh, you know, we sing the song about the fact that if you have pain, that he's the pain taker. If you're lost, he's the way maker. And, and it says somebody testify. I told you, I think, before, and I'll say it again. Pastor Johnny was saying one day, I was listening to him, and uh, he said, you know, maybe he was at the men's conference back uh, some time ago, but I heard him say it again. And he said, you know, I try to get somebody just to say, testify. He said, I just want to holler out. I'm driving down the road, listening. He said, I know people all around me. I had the windows down. He said, I'm hollering. Testify, testify, testify. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord be who we need to be. I mean, God is a freedom maker. He's what the song says. He's freedom shaking. Free of bondage type God. And that's what he wants. And you and I need to be able to testify just like those men did in my life this week. So when we think about the fact of the redeemed of the Lord say so. Well, what is God trying to say? To the children of Israel. And then how does that relate to me and you this morning? How can you and I take and digest Isaiah 43 uh, this morning? And from the standpoint, let me just kind of talk to you a moment. The first thing was that, that he wants to acknowledge the fact. Remember what I said that he's redeemed us before it ever happened? He is the Savior. Uh, according to verse 3 there, that big S there, he says that the Holy One of Israel, your Savior, he is the Savior. Um, when, when you think about Isaiah, uh, in its meaning is the salvation of Jehovah. Uh, and, and when you think about the fact of redemption, the Savior, the re release of bondage, you and I, that you and I recognize and that God has provided deliverance for us. Wherever we are, wherever we've been. Some of us this week said, I was asked a question, we were talking about some other things, said, you know, and, and questions asked me, to which I've said in this conference pulpit many times, have you forgiven your sex? And we have to come to that point where we can say, yes, I have forgiven myself. Yes, I believe in God. Yes, I know that God is real. Yes, I know that He is my Savior, that He cares for me. And so, He's wanting us to see that the Holy One of Israel, the one who creates, the one who shapes us, is still in very much active in our life. And he wants us to know that, that we're never alone. The Holy One of Israel came unrecognized, lived life, proved himself, was hung on a cross, got up from the grave and day was alive. And you're not going to live it. He is the one God. There is no other God before or after. Let the redeemed of the Lord. Let the redeemed of the Lord. Say so. I mean, it's real. And, and uh, when, when I was sitting at homecoming Friday night, I was listening as the homecoming court was coming out, and they were talking about each one as they came out, and, and they mentioned something about their lifetime. Almost every one of them were tied to uh, activity in church in some form or fashion, or SCA in some form or fashion. And, and I said, let the redeemed of the Lord, let us say so that it, it really makes a difference. The fact that God says, when I move, I can't person. It's God. And you, know, you think about curiosities in life, and you think about the fact of the Savior. You know, there's many times that we've talked about this recently in one of our meetings. You know, we can answer when something happens in our life, and we can just... We're in the midst and we get caught up in the wine. Oh, God, what the heck? Why does it happen to me? God, you know, you know that guy best. And it's okay. It's okay, of course. But then we need to move to the aspect, God, what do I need? God, what are you trying to teach me? In the midst of what's going on in my life, in life around me, God, what, what am I to learn in the midst of that? And, 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 and that's so significant for us. That God lays it out. Maybe, maybe it's not clear sometimes, but, well, you know, God, show me. Show What am I supposed to learn? It's okay to come back and say, there's a time, God, why? I don't understand. Then we move. Okay, God, what am I supposed to learn? See the difference? The difference 
question and the curiosity of the why. When you, you think about those questions, not only why, but who or what or God how. How am I supposed to believe God? What am I supposed to do? Where am I going? God, where are you taking me? God, what, what, what is the focus that you want me to be? Because see, here's the thing. According to verse 1, he's basically summoning us because he is our creator, because he's formed us, because he's shaped us. He's made us. And he says, I've called you. And he says, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. He summoned us. Many, many people today that you and I come in contact with don't declare God as God. They live our lives. They live our lives. And it's such a way that God does not exist. But what he's talking to you and I as the church, as Christians, that we let the redeemed of the Lord, may they, they say so, and may we speak out as a result of the redemption, the calling, the touch. Every one of us. As I said a moment ago in the prayer, you have been born again. Touched of God. And He knows what's best and He desires that we follow His footsteps. That we're created, according to verse 7, that we're created for His glory. He said, Everyone is called by my name and whom I have created for my glory when I formed and when I made it. So you think about that from the standpoint. He is the Savior, find encouragement in the midst of that. And God will do whatever it takes. Remember what we said in the beginning. That God was willing in, in speaking to the Jews to give up Egypt, Ethiopia, Africa, big things, the Cyrus for our release. He's willing to do whatever it takes in our life to draw us close, to minister to us. He'll never leave us, and He'll never forsake us. That's who He is. The second thing when you think about is in verses 4 through 7. And the thing is that you and I can find in the midst, not only did he create us, not only did he shape us, not only is he as our Savior, but he desires to comfort us. Can you imagine the accusations that the children of Israel were going through this? And we, we've seen that over and over again about that. And we've seen their actions and reactions and, and those kinds of things. But he's talking about the fact that the God of all comfort, when he comes in there, he says, we are precious. He says, since you are precious in my sight. You know, we, we've said that little song, red, yellow, black, and white. They are precious. God's creation, you and I, we're precious. We're precious in the sight of God. Honored in God's sight. He, he loves us. And then he comes down to verse 5, and he, and he tries to reassure. He says, do not fear. Do not fear. So I want someone having a discussion and Someone off base discussion on Facebook. I, I didn't comment because there was a ton of comments coming on to it, but they were talking about fearing God. One person was making the case of fearing the sense of all. The other person was making a fear of uh, a sense of just being afraid of God. Here's the thing. I think it goes hand in hand. I think we've lost our fear in God in that who He is. In that what He can do. If He so chooses. They could take his finger and just wipe us out with his wipe of his finger. That, that type of fear. And then the awe, the sense of losing the awe that we forgot who God is, the majesty of God, and who he really wants to be in our life. And so I watched that Facebook post go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And, and, and the thing is that we need to understand that God wants us to come into him as little children. The innocence of the Lord. And I can get that picture. I told you before, there's nothing greater than what you and I experience, and I experienced it. Shelby's here this morning, but when she'll tell you, we'll go back in the back, and little kids just come and put their arms around him. You know, they're all about this high, so they're grabbing your legs, and here they go. And they just wrap you up. It's kind of like being a grandparent, and here they come running, or you come home, dad, or mom from work, and here they come running. That's what God wants us something about when you pick that towel up and you hold him in your arms. It's a sense of comfort. To the end of you. That's what God wants to do in your life. 
He says, God, don't come. He says, do not be afraid. We do need to be in awe of God. We need to recognize the fear in the sense of reverence towards God. But you and I never need to be afraid to go to God. To go to God and be honest and to open up because he's a God. Here's the beauty of that. He wants to direct our steps. He wants to give us those teaching moments. He, he wants to move in our life and, and that God will see us through. Not only set it out there, not only walk with us through it, but he's going to see us all the way through. That's the touch of all my God. That's the, the purpose and the presence. He's a God. He's a Savior of the world. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord proclaim it. You and I, somebody, testify. The third thing that we find this morning is really the latter part of verse 4. And it's the fact that I want you to understand something. God loves you. You may not like the position that you're in. You may not like the lifestyle you're living. But he loves you. He loves you where you are. Verse 4 talks about that. He says, you're precious. You're honored. And I love you. So much that I will give whatever it takes. I'll, I'll give other men in your place. I'll let other people to exchange for your life. He loves you. Sometimes, I think sometimes when we're in those difficult circumstances and we back up and say, God, why? But God wants to deal with it. We forget that God really loves us. And we go back to verse 2. Don't you see that? It says, when you pass, remember now, speaking in the midst of the children of Israel coming out. But think about in our life. We sing that song with the ocean. The ocean drives. Wow. Think about it. He says, when you pass through the waters, I'm going to be with you. What does that mean, Pastor? The waters of affliction. The waters of circumstances that are thrown at us, that, that are obstacles in our life. Things when an infant we break our arm. And we have to learn to work through it. Things when things happen to us and you know life changes in just a moment. And we have to work through it. We wonder what God is doing in the midst of that. And what he really says is, I'll be there. I'll be there. In the midst of the waters. In the midst of the rivers of trouble. He says, the rivers, they will not overflow you. This morning, I don't know what you walked in this building with God does. I know what I walked in with. You don't know what I walked in with. But I dare say that all of us came in with something on our mind. Might not be ourselves personally, might be somebody very close to us, but some rivers of troubles, some river, rivers maybe of tears. And, and basically what God says, they will not overflow you. What he says is, I'm going to be there with you. I'm going to buoy you. I'm going to see you through. Then he says, when you walk through the fire, the fire of turmoil. The fires of the furnace. And sometimes Satan may turn the fire up a few times. Like Nebuchadnezzar did on the three little boys. But when others look in, and you and I are walking as the redeemed of the Lord, then they won't see your eye by yourself. They'll see God in this They'll see God in the midst of the turmoil. And what the word says is that when the flames rise up around you, they will not burn you. Why? Because we're protected in the hands of God. We're protected in the presence of God. When the circumstances of life seem insurmountable, God wants to be there. God still cares. And God wants you and wants me to know that we're valuable. 
that life is valuable. It's valuable enough that he told us that he was going to redeem us before he ever did. And he followed through. And he sent Jesus. That's how valuable it is. That's how valuable it is when somebody comes up around us and they put their arm around us and they say, hey, I'm walking with you. Or when somebody comes alongside of you to help you through a tough ordeal. When somebody just shows up out of the blue to, to do something for you that you were unexpected, let the redeem of the Lord say so. It's so important for us to look at that, that, that you and I shout it out, that we worship God in the midst of the circumstances. We're to be His witnesses. And to be reminded, as verse 13 says in the latter part, that we're held in the palm. There's one last thing in just a short few comments. He is Savior. He's God of comfort. He's a God that loves us where we are. And He's a God who's in control. You know, sometimes we feel like life's out of control. Might not be your life, might be somebody that's close to you and you're trying to influence them. And you feel like life's out of control. Be reminded there in verse 13 when he says, even from eternity, I am he. And there's none can deliver me out or deliver you out of my hands. And then he says, I act and basically no one can reverse it. Here's the deal. Let the redeemer of the Lord say so because God is sovereign. And no matter what we're going through, no matter the decisions we make, sometimes we make the wrong decisions. Sometimes we make decisions that cause failure. But God is the one who comes along and gets us up, stands us up, takes us on and on. And sometimes, as the form blueprint says, He carries us because we're too weak to walk on our own. So this morning, when we when we think about that, you think about the redeemed of the Lord. You think about the fact of who God is. I'm reminded by something that was said to me a long, long time ago. And not too long ago, it was said to me again. Nothing catches God by surprise. Nothing. Catches us off guard. Catches us by surprise. We, we tend to crash and burn. Panic. And get overly emotional. God. Nothing catches us. And that's what he wanted to reassure the Jews, the children of Israel, us, his greatest creation, no matter what comes our way, remember that we are God's people and we're special. We're special with God. And he wants us, as we read, as we understand, as we study, just like in the midst, of, if you look there in verses 9, 10, right along in there, it's like a courtroom presentation. And what God is saying is, so everybody else, it's kind of like the prophets of Baal and Elijah. Go let them do what they try to do. They call and call and call, nothing happens. <coughs> then Elijah, God showed up. So that's kind of what, if you think about 9 and 10 in, in Isaiah 43, God said, let them. Let them gather together. Let them order their people to assemble. Let them declare and bring. and let, Let's see the evidences. But then he says to you and I, be my witnesses. Be my witnesses. Whatever it is, just speak the truth. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so in word, in action, in deed, and in lifestyle. And God says, I will. 